Welcome to our Toronto. My name is Mia Nielsen. I'm the director of the fair and I would like to welcome you to our platform talk. This is Decolonizing Museums and Collections. Uh, it is presented by the Art Gallery of Ontario. We are joined by Julie Nagam. She's the Canadian Research Chair in Indigenous Arts, Collaborative and Digital Media and Associate Professor of the University of Winnipeg. In addition, she is also curator of uh, Nuit Blanche in Toronto as well as uh, Larry Osei-Mensa. He's an independent curator and co-founder of Art Noir. Julie Crooks is here, associate curator in photography of the Art Gallery of Ontario. Sandra Jackson Dumont, director and CEO of the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art in LA. And our moderator is the wonderful Wanda Nanabush. She's curator of indigenous art also from the Art Gallery of Ontario. Enjoy. Welcome everyone to the Art Toronto and AGO panel, Decolonizing Collections and Museums. I'm very happy to welcome our panelists. You're gonna have an exciting 30 minutes with us talking about decolonization and the work we're doing in museums. I wanna take a minute uh, to give everyone's bio and tell you who's talking today, and then we will get into a conversation. So I'm Wanda Nanabush. I'm an Anishinaabe Kwe from Bosley First Nation, Wolf Clan, currently the curator of Indigenous art at the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto, Canada. And we have Larry Osei-Mensa, uh, who uses contemporary art as a vehicle to redefine how we see ourselves and the world around us. As a curator and a cultural critic, he has organized exhibitions and programs at commercial and nonprofit galleries around the globe from New York City to Rome, two of my favorite places in the world. Moreover, <laughs> he has actively documented cultural happenings and uh, dynamic visual artists working today. A native of the Bronx, he is also the co-founder of Art Noir, a 501c3 and global collective of culturalists who design multimodal experiences aimed to engage this generation's dynamic and diverse creative class. Art Noir endeavors to celebrate the artistry and creativity by black and brown artists around the world via virtual and in-person experiences. He also was the contributor to the first ever Ghanaian Pavilion for the 2019 Venice Biennale with an essay on the work of visual artist Lynette Yadam Boakeyi. And Actually, I yes. must say, I did see that pavilion and it was the best at Venice. It was like phenomenal. Thank so you. welcome, Larry. Thank you. Next, we have Sandra Jackson Dumont, who joined the Lucas Museum of Narrative Arts as director and CEO, CEO in January 2020. Welcome to COVID directing. <laughs> uh, tasked with leading the institution through its opening and beyond, Jackson Dumont came to the Lucas Museum from the Met, where she served as the Frederick P. and Sandra P. Rose Chairman of Education from 2014 to 2019. Throughout her career, Jackson Dumont has developed programming around museums, collections, and special exhibitions to engage a broad range of audiences from school-age children, teachers, artists, and scholars. At the Met, she conceived of and managed an array of dynamic public programs, community engagement, and academic initiatives, and live arts performances for diverse audiences. Known for her ability to blur the lines between academia, public culture, and non-traditional art-going communities, she is invested in curating experiences that foster dynamic exchanges between art artists, past, present, public, private, people, places. <laughs> so welcome, Sandra. Dr. Julie Nagam, Nagam. <laughs> see, that's why I said it earlier. Um, yes. She's a Can Canada research <laughs> I, I, I mean, It's like, I always extend it for some reason. We've known each other for so long is the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Arts, Collaboration and Digital Media, the former Research Chair of Indigenous Arts of North America, which was a joint position with the Winnipeg Art Gallery, 
Dr. Negum is an associate professor in the Department of Art History at the University of Winnipeg. She is the inaugural artistic director for the 2020-2021 for Nuit Blanche Toronto, one of the largest public exhibitions in North America. So we're excited for this. Dr. Negum is the director of Abidjan, say it, I said it wrong. New Media Lab and, and co-director of the Kishdash Dege Collaborative Research Center. So as you know, she is very, very busy and has many, many hats. And one of them is the collective member of BLAM, which works on curatorial activism, indigenous methodologies, public art, digital technologies, and engagement with place. She's also an artist. So welcome, Julie. And next we have my beautiful colleague, Julie Crooks, um, is, she is the, currently the assistant cur associate curator of photography at the AGO. Um, I don't know if we're allowed to announce your new position, Julie. You think so? Go for it. Uh, all right. Um, very excitingly, which has been in the works for years, um, we can finally say that uh, we have a new position for curator of African and diasporic arts at the Art Gallery of Ontario, and Julie will be leading us. I'm very excited for that. Some of Julie's uh, projects, the first project at the AGO was Free Black North. Um, she received her PhD in the Department of History of Art and Archaeology at the School of Oriental and African Studies, or SOAS as it's known, the University in London. I'm very jealous of that. I always wanted to take that program where her research focused on historical photography in Sierra Leone, West Africa, and the diaspora. Prior to joining the AGO, she curated and co-curated a number of exhibitions, including No Justice, No Peace, From Ferguson to Toronto, and most recently, Here We Are Here, Black Canadian Contemporary Art, co-curated with Sylvia Forney and Dominique Fontaine. So welcome, Julie. I think that's all of us. Thank you. I think we are fully here and present. So I wanted to start us off with thinking about um, what does decolonizing mean in the museum context? What are some of the ways we consider the meaning of this word and the meaning of this work for each of you? I'd love to start with you, Sandra, if that's okay. <laughs> and if everyone you could to do that. <laughs> Um, you can start with Professor Julie or the other Julie, since there are two of them. Oh, I don't even get a choice. All right, Julie Crooks, take it away. Oh boy, okay. I was just joking, but go ahead. That's, that's good. Um, uh, what does decolonizing the institution mean to me? Um, I think uh, it means many things and you know, we only have 30 minutes. Uh, so I'll be short. Um, I think the key to decolonizing um, the institution is to kind of uh, disentangle and um, uh, disengage, dismantle uh, the kind of Eurocentric ways in which we um, uh, uh, approach, engage, think about um, and I'm thinking, of course, the AGO, because that's where we live, but um, uh, art institutions in general, because they obviously are built on a kind of European Eurocentric uh, empire building, hoarding of looting, looted uh, artifacts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, that have always either uh, pathologized blackness or indigeneity or you know, um, everyone that is considered uh, other. Um, so um, for me, it's how do we tackle um, unlearning those histories within the institution and then uh, making very radical interventions um, through our collections. Um, I'm sure I'm answering your question towards the end, but anyway, I'm going to go for it. Um, you know, through our hiring practices, uh, exhibition practices, um, uh, 
pedagogy if we are you know teaching at institutions and also um, uh, in our respective institutions um, and how we engage with language um, I think is how uh, amongst many other ways of course but this is just kind of my preliminary thinking yeah excellent Sandra are you ready now <laughs> I was ready before, but I, I literally have to say that oftentimes I'm in these conversations that I don't know why I always get picked first. Um, and so today I was having one of those moments where I'm like, not me. But anyway, I can talk about this all day long, as I'm sure all of the people on this call can. Um, I think that um, what does it mean? It means exactly what Julie said. It means like really recentering or decentering the conversation, um, really thinking differently about what how the canon of our history is defined, but also how the peoples and practices were are implemented in the institutions. Um, and that is from literally how do we create a sense of belonging? Um, so this colonial approach to um, hiring practices and this colonial approach to how institutions collect um, really are bound up with each other. And so how do we actually talk about that as an inclusive ecosystem of activity as opposed to today we're going to tackle this, tomorrow we're going to tackle that. Like how are these things netting up together? The other thing that I think, um, so, so what I'm realizing that when everyone, when someone asks me about like, what is the definition, I move directly into not talking about what it is and talking about like how it actually lands on our practices and our activities. And I think that sometimes we approach this work from an intellectual activity as opposed to a humanistic activity, um, which is also tied up in how we present historically the history of people in these spaces through objects. And so I, 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 I honestly um, uh, feel that um, if I were to define how institutions um, are colonial in their approach, I think that it is inextricably linked to um, the history of how places were colonized. Um, and so, um, again, that would take a longer conversation. Um, and so um, hopefully that, that puts out there a little bit of a perspective, um, but yeah. Excellent. Larry, would you like to share your views? Um, I concur with uh, Julie and Sandra. I think one thing I think about is, you know, how do we just reconsider, you know, how the museum or the institution functions from the ground up? Because a lot of what I've been seeing is attempts to put band-aids on, you know, whether it's gaps in the collection, gaps in staffing, gaps in programming, and really taking a step back and reevaluating, you know, what a museum looks like, what it is, how did it serve your community, taking it out of this, this capacity of a cabinet of curiosities mm -hmm. and really making it about, you know, deeper, more heartfelt, humanistic engagement. Um, and, you know, it's, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. I mean, I first engaged this idea of decolonization when I was in South Africa 2016. And they were talking about decolonizing schools and trying to understand what does that mean to decolonize your education, right? And then and imagine, and then not only imagine, but strategize, plan, and execute um, a strategy, uh, an approach that is more inclusive, you know, because I think reading Jeff Chang's book, We Gonna Be All Right, he makes this statement where he feels like the idea of diversity has been co-opted you know, by organizations um, as this tool to look um, or, or pretend to be as if they're uh, progressive. And many of us on this call know that that's, that's, it's lip service, you know, so I think also it's putting people's feet to the fire, you know, so whether that's board members, whether that's senior leadership, and really kind of holding everybody accountable to the, the goals and the missions. Um, and the other thing that, that's come up in other conversations is, you know, the reevaluation of the organizational mission, depending on your institution, you know, because I think a lot of times it's built on a particular idea, mantra, and vision, and does that apply in 2020? And if it doesn't, how do you work collectively to cultivate a vision that is inclusive, 
um, that is um, pushing against this colonial structure and way of thinking and really looking to apply something that is more generative. Beautiful. Um, Dr. Julie? <laughs> We're both doctors, so I don't think it's going to work. Well, I think also, uh, I introduced I'm a fellow doctor. doctor. So I'm just like, it, it's a, it's never happened before, but I have to admit, I kind of like it. <laughs> I, um, for me, I think it's a full takeover. Like I, I see it at all strategic levels and it's not just like, you know, everybody's hit on it in different aspects, but it's actually just a full, um, takeover and a kind of entire radical shift of what it what it normally is and even the structures even you know like there's lots of conversations around like we're going to hire this person or we're going to have this person or we're going to put this new job in and i and i think that you know until we actually see ourselves in leadership positions where we can actually do those full overalls which we're starting to see across the country in canada anyways but it's it's so slow that it needs to happen quicker and the other thing is is i just i get excited thinking about what that potential is like the winnipeg art gallery has done some really great work but that's because we had to build an, in, an inuit art center and because of that center then push back of what we had to think about where we are rooted what kind of Tentuous relationship do we have with indigenous and um, uh, racialized folks? And it's like, what what is it that we want to do? And so they they had to do it a little bit differently because they didn't have a choice. And I think that um, we you know we start to see institutions start to do like the Human Rights Museum he, also here in Winnipeg, also a frustrating uh, space as you know we've seen it lots in the news. Again, kind of the aftermath of like, oh my God, we need to get some indigenous people at the table and 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 form a committee. And I'd say the the difference from when we started, even within the university system, whether that had been OCAD or the Winnipeg uh, University of Winnipeg for me, it's like the the way that it shifts is you need people in leadership positions that have the willpower and the energy to do that work, but also we need to see BIPOC folks in those leadership positions to actually make that radical change. And I think that, you know, it's at all levels, just how you said, Larry, the board, to the um, CEO, the director, to the educational staff, to the director in programming, all the bits, you know, it needs, and, and same with frontline people, the people who work in the, in the shops, our security, everything, it needs, it needs an, an entire overhaul. And I think that for me, uh, I think that that's part of the project of, decolonizing. It's not just like checking the boxes, inviting one person in, creating a job that's usually temporary, you know, and, and expecting them to do all that labor. It's a full overhaul of the entire system. And if I could just jump in, I think what Sandra's done with the Lucas Museum, like when I saw that list of who you hired, I was like, yeah, you know, um, really just kind of like putting it, your money where your mouth is, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, in terms of the hiring practice. And I would love to hear more about that decision that you made that like, all right, I'm in, I'm in the driver's seat. This is how we're going to make it happen. And did you get any pushback? Yeah, no. I mean, I think that that's what's so amazing is um, <laughs> I remember being interviewed about, well, two things. One, I remember saying, um, our communications team saying we should really um, let's make an announcement about some of our hires. Um, and I didn't, the, the great thing is that, you know, I didn't, I didn't hire all of those people. That's good, right? <laughs> I did not hire all of those people, but to make sure that, that, that we are hiring is my job, right? That we are having a, and I just got here. So particularly that was like months ago. So I really had just gotten here, but I think- Just, Larry, just, to, just to jump in real quick. Could you also just clarify for folks who don't know what you guys did in, at the institution in terms of who you hired, how you hired? Okay. I don't want to assume people know, sorry. Yeah, we have a, um, we hired, uh, or we shared a press release announcing six women hires. Um, and they were all people that identified as women and they were all but one were people of color. Um, and, um, and one of the things that's interesting is that in the news or in the, one of the people that interviewed me asked me why 
Um, was I looking for women and was I looking for people of color? And because I'm in leadership, Larry knows me long enough to know that I just say, I, I strategically speak my mind um, <laughs> and I'm well trained to do so. But in this case, I find myself like, wow, okay, so does it sound bad if I say, you know, I was looking for people of color or was I looking for people of color? Or was I looking for the most qualified people? And they were people of color. And so I said to the person, I said, you know, that's so interesting that you asked me that initially when she said you happen to be looking for people of color, I said, you know, well, yeah. And then she started asking about the specific people. And then my reaction was, can we go back? Because I, I have to live my values. Like this is actually who I am. And I want the people who have come to work here to come to work here because they they can be their full professional and emotional selves, not necessarily be a facsimile of that. So I said, I'm always looking for people of color. I'm, I don't happen to be a black woman. I am a black woman and I self-identify as such. And the people that we announced were people that were in curatorial and in construction. And in, but normally what we do at institutions is simply announce just what we consider to be the intellectual cabinet. And that's not a full picture of how we work as an institution. And so it was the Erica who's in IT and it was Larissa who's in construction, who is, and then there was blah, 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 who was in, so it was a whole thing. So I thank you, Larry, for that like moment in the sun. But I also said, and I wish they had printed this, these are not unicorns. So I don't get a cookie for doing what I should be doing. You see what I'm saying? Like, I don't want a claim around that. I'm glad that people like trotted it out as a, a real big thing, but, and I'm so grateful because also what I realize is that when you become a leader, sometimes we forget that like I am a, this is a BIPOC led organization. Like, don't forget I'm actually in this body. So I think that sometimes that that doesn't show through and I think it's a really important point. Um, but I don't get a cookie for it because it actually is what I should be doing. Um, it, it just is, you know, and so if that could be normalized, I think it would be helpful. But thank you, Larry, for that. I appreciate it. No problem. And then just to piggyback what Dr. Julie said. <laughs> um, I'm see Dr. Julie's. <laughs> uh, Nagam? Winnipeg. Um, your, your point about this takeover, it also makes me think about, and, and then piggyback on what Sandra is mentioning, how do you create agency within the organization, right? You know, so like, I'm lucky enough that, you know, I, I just was the former senior curator at MoCAD. I came to that position as a fully formed adult and I knew what I was gonna accept and what I wasn't gonna accept. And I wasn't gonna come in and, and try to adapt myself um, to the point where I was losing myself. And I think that's an important thing where people can come, be their full self, have agency. And so when you were talking about that, it just triggered my thought about the Four Seasons Hotel, because um, some may or may not know I study hospitality management in grad school. And one of the things that makes them such an important organization is that, you know, from janitorial to senior leadership, everybody has agency to make sure the guest experience is the best possible experience. And so, you know, thinking about that from an institutional standpoint, making sure that from construction to senior leadership, you know, everybody feels like they can be their full self. They can, you know, interject and, and critique. Because I think that's an issue that I noticed, you know, at MoCAD is that, you know, there might be issues internally and people were afraid to kind of critique the situation. And for me, it's like whatever's going to get us to the best possible result, that's what we should be aiming for, as opposed to um, being afraid if you make a comment that you will be uh, chastised for it. And so I think how do you create an environment where people can be their full self, there's agency, and that the critique is really with the aim of making the overall institution the best that it can be. Sorry. I think part of that is also the the you know, we talked about like decentering Eurocentrism, but it means actually, that means you have to center something else. And so um, I think we miss that part sometimes. And I know Julie, this is like in line with what Larry is talking about in terms of your work. And I mean, the work I do too is 
when you take a kind of sovereign position, which means bringing your full self entire and the entire history that comes with that and all the ancestral power of that um, to work, it means in a way you can't allow for a yes or a no, you know, you can't even allow the question to happen. So I wondered if we could talk about that in terms of the work you're doing. I know you're always kind of centering indigeneity in some kind of way. I just used indigeneity and I hate using that word. <laughs> I just want to say like, I think that there's two things. I think that um, as a person who works in the university and is training and mentoring um, upcoming BIPOC students, it's just what just what Larry and has alluded to for Sandra. It's like we need to see ourselves reflected. We need to see us in those positions. And so, you know, just what you're saying, Wanda, is that you know you bring your whole self. You don't apologize. You don't take no for an answer. You know, you keep at it. And like you know, and in some of the most awkward, um, really uh, sometimes terrible or traumatic situations where you're getting kicked back from lots of different people, it's like no, you have to do this. And if we don't do this, then all the work that we've been doing for the last five or six years is just gone. If we don't do this, you know, we're not sending the right kind of message. If we actually don't make a statement and not only just like the, the paper statement or like the, you know, like the patting people on the back kind of statement, it's like you don't need to make a statement if your institution is leading. If you're actually leading in the way that you do your work, in the way that you organize yourself, in, the, in those kind of core uh, fundamental beliefs. So for me, it's about collaboration, it's learning by doing, it's thinking about fluid methods, it's putting the knowledge that my parents gave me of like, you know, being resistant or feisty or somebody would say overconfident, whatever, whatever those pieces are, you need to bring those to the table. And I think that that's the hard, hard work that all of us are doing in order to make that shift and change to open up spaces for the new generation to come in and, and push them even further, right? I think on the exhibition side, we have, like we're, we're kind of pulled in different directions as well. And so, you know, there are those projects where we're kind of trying to undo a certain history or a way of looking at us or make an education happen around, you know, stereotypes and racism and this kind of thing. And then there are those projects where we are forefronting contemporary art and we're putting our voices and narratives like right at the forefront. And Julie, I know you've been involved in projects on both sides of that. And I wondered if you could talk maybe about, you know, your most recent um, exhibition of contemporary black artists and then Free Black North, which was a very different kind of project. Maybe that would be. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's a kind of delicate balance as, as we all know. Um, but at the forefront of it always, because I'm a big old woman too, and I come to this from, you know, uh, an outside practice. Um, so I came into the institution as an independent curator. So that kind of independence and autonomy uh, always um, fuels me and fuels my kind of methodology. Uh, I'm also interested in archives. So archival projects that dig into, you know, so-called hidden histories and moving those also to the forefront. Um, so that a project like Free Black North was about an archive of tin types uh, that, um, you know, the, where the subjects were uh, black, uh, black subjects who'd come through the up Underground Railroad, settled in south Southwestern Ontario and had their photos taken. Right, so really quite small, um, and, and of course mounted during Canada's sesquicentennial and called Free Black North, italicizing free, so that one had to really think about what does this mean, what does it mean to be free in a place that is a so-called refuge, but also has its you know deep histories of anti-Black racism, um, and then you know the next project is Micheline Thomas. Right, so you know, kind of contemporary, queer, fierce um, African American uh, artists um, whose mission is to kind of again decenter uh, the kind of Eurocentric art historical canon um, and insert Black women within that that canon. So. Um, and of course, that was that was wonderful. I, I, I you know had such joy working on 
on that project. But I think we always have to balance, you know, the kinds of projects that we're working on. And for me, it always has to, as I said, center, um, you know, the things that I'm interested in, frankly. I mean, I feel as if, you know, there isn't time for me to be involved in a kind of pet project, you know, something that, you know, even my rotation. So we have to do, you know, we rotate our various uh, um, departments, minus photography. Um, the idea is to show the medium chronologically from its invention, 1839 to contemporary. And I make sure that I'm mining my collection or our collection, which doesn't, hasn't necessarily um, reflected uh, that history through the lenses of Black photographers or Black subjects. But I am relentless in my search to make sure that the, a kind of balanced uh, history is told, parallel histories are told. So if it means borrowing from another institution or a private collector to tell that history, that's what I'll do. So I'm not sure if that answered your question, but oh, um, I'm, that's, that's kind of my, my, my mission. Um, and with, you know, this uh, global arts of Africa and the diaspora, I think that does give me, um, you know, or give us as an institution a way to think about you know, Africa as global and its diaspora and, you know, and how many, and the fact that it lives in each one of our departments, Canadian, indigenous, prints and drawing, photography, contemporary, modern. Um, so uh, it can be a really interesting collaboration. Thanks, Julie. Um, we are running out of time, but I wanna give the last words to Larry um, because, <laughs> because we haven't put you on the spot <laughs> yet. Um, but I think that working outside the institution independently, um, you've been really successful at raising a lot of profiles of a number of artists and how do you go about, you know, the choices that you make and, you know, it's, it's always um, put on us as soon as we say, okay, this is the artist I'm putting forward, there's all the other artists we didn't, right? So these are really difficult choices when we work in a situation where most of our artists are not on view. Yeah. Um, well, I think just um, to piggyback what Julie just said, it starts with, well, it's a balance between what I'm interested in and what is important, you know, and that's something that I learned, you know, from one of my first mentors, Bob Buck. He ran Brooklyn Museum for 13 years, Albright Knox, and he said, you have to make that distinction. You know, you, you can't just focus on the things that you're excited about. So Julie talking about that balance. Um, and so always just being cognizant that there might be an artist that I personally, you know, might not be excited about per se, but what they're saying is very relevant, important, and necessary um, to further a conversation that I might be interested in exploring through my practice. Um, and then I think what I was going to mention before, um, communicating with colleagues. Um, I probably do more behind the scenes than I do in front in terms of like, there might be a painter or there might be a sculptor. Um, there was a show at York that, um, ah, she just left, curator in Toronto. Emily, Emily Schenger. Yes, so there's a show she did. I met her in Toronto three, four years ago. And she was talking about this show she did of um, artists, not trained and I got excited about that. You know, so I think, you know, a lot of the artists I find one through other artists, I find through talk. Yeah, so one, um, getting recommendations from other artists. Artists I always feel will be the harshest critic of another artist's work. And so they kind of do that first step where if they come to me from another artist, it's like, okay, it has to be good to a degree. Is it work for what I'm working on? And if not, I might just say to Sandra, hey, there's this artist in LA who's doing this thing, like really still under the radar, or, you know, or this, you know, writer or whatever the case may be, and just try to introduce them to different people. Um, and so not trying to assume all the responsibility. One, two, not making it about myself and making it about the artist and the conversation. And um, three, just balancing what I like personally, you know, because it's some of those projects that you're going to 
you know, steer from like inception to execution. And then there are other pro projects that are just really relevant right now, you know, or could be relevant in the future. So like, I'm sure you've all had inquiries, people reach out. Like I just got an email, this institution wants to do a BIPOC exhibition in January. And I'm just like, yeah, okay. You know, if, if, if we do this as an independent, you're gonna pay, you know? And I think being clear about that. Um, and I think also just because I've had, even though it wasn't a, a, a long time, you know, just being able to work in an institution for a year and some change and seeing like the structure, I think will allow me to be a better partner with institutions that I work with because I have a sense of what the pain points are because some of them are just kind of across the board. Um, and then it allows me to be a better advocate for the artists because you usually know what the gaps are and how you can be of support. So it's a multitude of ways. And, you know, you also got to get lucky, you know, right artist, right time. Um, and the work is just kind of vibrating um, on a level that, you know, the zeitgeist is ready to respond and embrace. Thanks so much. I want to thank you all for being on this panel, which felt extremely short. <laughs> yeah, we need more time. <laughs> we could have gone for hours, I think, and maybe we should, we should just do that over wine like another time we can get together. But I do wanna thank you all, not just for being here on the panel, but for all the work that you're doing to change this colonial system that we all are engaging with, dealing with, feeling the pain and effect of. So I just wanna thank you for that. 